All right, well, welcome to our February in the Garden talk. This has been an interesting February and an interesting 2022 so far. So we'll kind of tie everything into what's going on this month, this year. For housekeeping, um, the presentation is being recorded. And uh, feel free to ask. We don't have a big group. We have a few more people who have signed up, so people might join. But feel free to ask questions as we go along. You can put them in the chat. You can unmute yourselves. I did turn off all the cameras um, just to get a recording without um, the cameras on top of the recording. And um, I have my camera off. Let's see, I can turn my camera on for just a second. Hello, there I am, real person here. So my name is Maggie O'Neill and yeah, joining you from Claremont, but turn off my camera so I can save bandwidth. And then if you like a PDF of this presentation, our presentation recordings, um, not all of them, but most of them can be found on our website on the left-hand side under recent presentations. And I'll be sure to put those there um, about an, in, in, right after we get off of our presentation. And then there also will be a recording of this on YouTube. We'll have a resource sheet and also a, a, PD, a PDF of the presentation. Okay, and if you wanna save any links that I drop in the chat at the end, then you can click uh, the three dots on the upper right-hand side of your chat box and it should be save chat, should be an option there, okay? So we're part, we're the San Bernardino County Master Gardeners, part of the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And our volunteers are trained um, in, uh, in so <laughs> they go through an eight, sorry, they go through an 18 week or 50 hour training course. We're currently doing our training course. We are taking a few um, more applications because we extended the deadline and I'll drop that information in the chat. So if you are interested in becoming a master gardener, and you live in San Bernardino County, then reach out to us and I'll share that information at the end. But our volunteers are trained to share peer-reviewed research with the public. And in our county, we really like to focus on growing food, sustainable landscaping, and better living through gardening. But really, we're just a bunch of enthusiastic gardeners who love to share our passions with the public. We have a couple of other programs in our county. They include a nutrition program, FNEP, master food preservers that we partner with quite a bit. And on February 26th, we'll be at the Fontana Library from 10 to four o'clock. You can find information about that on our website. And our master food preservers will be there doing a presentation, a demonstration on um, jam making, I believe it is. And then 4-H is also a program that we have in our county. We have a seed library as part of our county, and I'll talk about that more toward the end of the presentation, but basically we share donated and community share seed, community shared seeds with the public. And we're gonna to transition to more of a pop-up um, style rather than a seed library at a physical location that's permanent just because of COVID and all the challenges with facilities being closed. So if you're in the Highland area this Saturday, um, the 12th, what's that was today? Yep, the 12th, um, then we'll be at the Highland Library from 11 to one, and we'll have seeds if you wanna come get free seeds at the library. And we're gonna expand that to, I think we're gonna work with Ontario, the Ovit Library and a community center in, I believe it's in Yukaipa and a few other places where we're gonna get some pop-up seed libraries. But if you're in the Highland area, and that's also on our website, then you can stop by and we'll be there from 11 to 1 p.m. this Saturday. And then we also have free classes that I'll talk about more in just a moment. I always do a public service announcement before my presentations, um, but this is really relevant this time of year. So it sort of goes beyond just being the regular public service announcement and is um, important to know and to think about when you're in your garden in February. So I wanna to talk to you guys about citrus greening really quickly. It's also known as HLB or Huang Long Bing, and it's a deadly citrus disease. It can be also spread um, into other plants in the citrus family. And um, it, uh, uh, the Indian curry leaf and the orange jasmine are also two other plants that are affected. Okay, so just a second. Okay. 
Okay, sorry about that. Um, so this disease has been found, this deadly citrus disease. It's not harmful to people, but it is deadly to citrus. And it's been found all over Southern California. So if you look at this map, this is Southern California. And within these blue lines, the disease has been found. Um, this it was most recently the boundary of this quarantine area was expanded in December. And the Ontario area, if you're anywhere near the Ontario area, they went from having, I think, five or seven infected trees, um, which they remove when they find out they're infected, to having over 80 infected trees. It's what it's a real big hot spot. So if you're in that area, it's really important that you take these steps to help protect your trees. The disease is spread by a tiny insect, the Asian citrus psyllid. It's small, about the size of a half a grain of rice or a little bit smaller, and it feeds at a 45 degree angle. So it's really characteristic. The larvae of this insect are much smaller and they're really identifiable by these waxy tubules. And this time of year is when this insect is laying eggs. And what the insect does is just like a mosquito spreads malaria, this insect will spread citrus greening disease as it feeds from one plant to another. And the reason it's so important to be mindful of this in February is because citrus is sending out its flush this time of year. And I have a slide, uh, like 10 or 15 slides from now that show a picture of that. And we'll touch back to this. The symptoms of the disease, again, it's a bacteria that's spread by this tiny insect. The symptoms of the disease um, are asymmetrical, midline of citrus fruit, brown seeds, and the fruit will be very bitter. It will also be misshapen and have a greening to it, but it's hard to tell, especially in this weather. Like if you have limes or lemons, um, they can, from the heat of the sun and the intensity of the sun, they can ripen on one side and sort of look like this. So it's not just this symptom. You want to, and Valencia oranges and honey mandarins will also re-green like this. So this symptom alone is not something to worry about. We get a lot of pictures of um, trees that do not have citrus greening. But what you want to look for is this misshapen fruit. If you see fruit that looks suspicious and you want to know, you can cut it open and see if it has aborted the seeds. The seeds will be brown or um, shriveled or dark colored. They won't be that light creamy color. These are later symptoms that you'll see in the trees and probably what the people in Ontario right now might be seeing in their trees is this asymmetrical yellowing. And really important to note, it's asymmetrical. So if you look at this picture here on the right, I think that's the same picture, you can see that it's just sort of splotchy and mottled. There's no symmetry to the yellowing. When you have symmetrical yellowing, then that is caused usually by a nutrient deficiency. But these would be the early symptoms of citrus greening that you wanna look out for. Not to be confused with citrus leaf miners who create um, terrible misshaping of the leaves, but they um, are mostly cosmetic. Occasionally they can spread disease, but most of the time they do not. And they're actually a little moth that's nocturnal. I always see on social media, people talking about various ways to treat this insect. And um, there really aren't any good products out there. This is largely cosmetic. If it bothers you, you could pinch off the leaves, but the leaves are still photosynthesizing. The damage that you see here is physical damage by the larvae. You can kind of see in these pictures here how there's a little track. And that's the larvae is eating the tissue in between the layers of the leaves. It's kind of cool. And this is something you'll very often see. You're probably not seeing it right now that much. It's usually in the spring and the fall. And we're going to probably start seeing it. You know, we've had crazy weather um, and we're probably going to start seeing them in a couple months, uh, but they might be out there right now as well. So if you see this, this is not citrus greening disease. It's the asymmetrical yellowing is the main thing you want to look for. So there's three steps that you can take. Um, there's a few more things that you can do, but there's three steps that you can take to help protect your citrus. And if you are anywhere near the Ontario area, I encourage you um, to um, share this information with friends and family because it really is up to us to prevent the spread of this disease. So we don't wanna share any stems and leaves when we're sharing fruit. I know during the holidays, 
that a lot of people share citrus um, wreaths and decorations and the mandarins look so beautiful with leaves. But if you look at this picture here, you can see if this insect is like smaller than a half a grain of rice, this is what the eggs look like. And you don't want to share stems and leaves. And I swear this time of year, daily, I see people posting on social media that they're generously sharing their citrus fruit and they're leaving the stems and leaves in. And you may not have the Asian citrus psyllid, but if you do, they can be hanging out on the stems and leaves. Technically, it is actually illegal to move the stems and leaves, but the main thing is it's just not best practices. So please just don't share stems and leaves. Spread the word about that, not the pest. So that's a big one. Don't share stems and leaves when you're sharing citrus fruit. Also don't share cuttings. It takes a couple like nine months to two years for citrus screening symptoms to show up in a tree. And so you can be sharing um, infected cuttings if you're sharing cuttings from your citrus tree, or if you're receiving cuttings, you may be bringing infected wood onto your property. So don't share cuttings. There's a clean source of budwood that you can um, uh, go to to get um, disease-free wood. So don't share cuttings, also actually illegal in California because of the disease. And the third one, and we have a slide later on about keeping ants out of your trees and plants, um, is to keep ants out of your trees and plants. Ants have some beneficial um, jobs in the garden. They act as decomposers and they even act as pollinators. But ants will farm um, harmful insects to our plants that secrete sugary solutions. So the Asian citrus psyllid, has these little waxy tubules and they feed on the juices of the plant and with their excrement is like a sugar solution. Same with an aphid or a scale. Any of the piercing sucking insects have an excrement that are most of them have an excrement that is a sugary solution and the ants will farm them. It's really interesting. They've actually shown like with scale that the ants will move the scale around the plant and they'll farm them. And so we may think they're eating them by farming them. You may have heard that term that they're farming them. So ants are doing a good thing by eating those insects, but the insects you're gonna be, um, they're protecting those insects from the beneficial insects in your yard. So some of those beneficial insects may be the surfid fly. It's one of my personal favorites. The juvenile eats lots of aphids. And it also eats the Asian citrus psyllid larvae. And if there's ants in the trees, the ants will throw these beneficial predators out. There's parasitic wasps that will get the Asian citrus psyllid larvae. And there's other parasitic wasps. And the ants will throw those out too. Same with the ladybugs, the ladybug larvae, praying mantis. Um, all those beneficial insects that we want to bring in, the ants will literally throw them out of the plant. And there's some cool videos if you want to watch it. Um, but the ants are definitely protecting these harmful pests, so we want to keep those uh, ants out of our plants. And that's true for our roses and our vegetables, and I even use ants as sort of like a detector species. So when I see ants in a tree or a plant, I'll follow the trail of ants, and then I can usually find some sort of invasive pest. Sometimes with large trees, it's a little bit harder to tell because they're maybe going up to the canopy, but ants in your plants is a good indication that you have some sort of other pest. And so with that, and this is something you'll see a lot in the spring, and I've noticed ants are sort of venturing into the house right now because it's so dry. So with that, you want to, um, you know, use the ants as your detectors for these pests. If the plant is a size where you can look for the pest, look for the pest and identify that. And then you're going to want to get the ants out of your plants so that they stop protecting them from the beneficial insects. And then you can also maybe treat the um, plant for the insects that the ants are farming. I hope that makes sense. So like if you have aphids in your roses and the ants are farming your aphids, again, they're farming their excrement, not the aphids themselves. Then you're going to want to have a two-step process where you're keeping the ants out. And there's a website where I'll show you a little bit later where you can find out more about that. And, um, and then you're going to want to like for the aphids, you can just do a simple spray with the hose. And that's usually enough to wash them off of your plants. Or if you're going to do some sort of other treatment like an insecticidal soap 
or a neem oil, you're still going to want to move those ants um, or keep those ants out of your plants. If you have figs and your figs are dropping early, be on the lookout for the black fig fly. Um, you may not see the fly, and I, I think I would have a hard time recognizing the fly from a standard fly, but if you see any of this sort of early dropping or this type of damage in your figs, then um, there's a website here that we'll drop in the chat and you can learn more about it. So if you have figs, be on the lookout for that. It's been found, I believe it was in Orange County, but it was near the border of our county. And we just wanna um, try to identify the spread of that so we can see what we're gonna do about that. There's also been, unfortunately, if you're in the Upland area, they found med flies. Um, when was that? In November. Might've found them in late October. And so it centered sort of around, if you're familiar with the 210 freeway, they call it the Claremont Curve here, um, where you pass sort of like um, what's the off-ramps baseline and mountain and campus. They found it right around that area. And so all around it is a quarantine and you're actually not supposed to remove fruit from your property. I think the main thing to know is if you live in this area, I would check out the website um, don't let any fallen fruit sit on your property or collect on your property. And if the Ag Commissioner or CDFA um, is active in your area, that's why. So far, they said they hadn't found any med flies outside of the quarantine area. And what they're doing is a, a release of sterile male flies um, to try to control the population. And the population, I think they go through two generations of flies, which takes about six months. So if they found this in November, they're hoping to lift the quarantine in June. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but we'll keep you posted on that in our monthly presentations. So if you guys have any questions about any of those pests, I'm happy to answer those at the end of the presentation. Um, but for now, I'm gonna go on. Um, so we're gonna talk just a real quick weather uh, check-in for February. We'll talk about what to plant, a little bit about what pests to look out for, how to care for your plants and other garden chores. Talk briefly about seed saving. So we have had um, like in the last six weeks where I am, you know, we've gone from this deluge of rain and this downpour, which, you know, it lasted long enough that we did get some good soaking, but a lot of it amounted to runoff and in some areas has caused flooding in our county um, and other areas. Um, so we had that right at the end of the year, right? And then um, we had uh, some cold weather in there, but then we had those terrible winds the last part of January. And then in some areas of the county, the winds are just continuing and it is just drying everything out. And then now we're having uh, heat advisories. So we've gone through almost all the advisories. No, well, and we had a frost advisory. So I think we've gone through most of the possible advisories in the last six weeks. So 2022 is really packing it in. Um, these are the rain totals that were in uh, January and really not a lot has changed. We really haven't gotten any um, rain since we did our January in the garden presentation. So we still only have, um, I think it's uh, um, 14 inches in Los Angeles, is that right? That's in Pomona. We'd have to look it up, but we don't have very much in Riverside. There's seven inches. Um, Los Angeles, it says 14, that was, that's a lot. Um, I think in Claremont, we're at seven or eight inches. So we have it, we're well under our average. We were really hopeful. We did get a lot of snowpack on top of Mount Baldy, you can still see some snow. So it's definitely better than nothing, but that the wind is really, really drying everything out. If you wanna check out more about um, your weather and, and especially if you have uh, wanna tie your irrigation system into the weather, there's this great website. Um, it takes a little bit of learning to navigate it, um, but we'll drop this in the chat, the California Irrigation Management Information System has a lot of information, um, so check that out. We'll drop that in the chat. Here's where we were in October of 2021. So, and you can see here we were on January 13th of this year. So actually, I guess I shouldn't discount the rain. We really did get a lot of rain. 
Uh, we really, really did. So look at the difference. Um, definitely out of the red in almost all of the areas in California. And surprisingly for Southern California, a large part of the um, San Bernardino County is only in moderate drought. Go moderate drought instead of like extreme drought. So, but it is predicted to be a dry and windy February. And this is where we are right now. Um, and I flip back and forth between the two maps and um, struggled to find any differences. So this is where we were um, still most of San Bernardino County, mostly in only moderate drought, which is um, great, but it's looking like we're not gonna get very much more rain for the rest of the spring. So um, we have a drought committee that will be doing more presentations online. And in person, we have a presentation, the one um, I think I mentioned in Fontana, I think I mentioned that, maybe I got distracted. So on uh, February 26th, oh, I told you. On February 26th, we'll be at the Fontana Library where, where we'll talk about uh, from the garden to the table. That's when our master food preservers will be presenting. And in the afternoon, we'll do a presentation on uh, sustainable landscaping and conserving water. So check that out on our website. Just a real quick look at the chill hours for this year, and this would be for fruit trees. Um, if you go to the website, uh, UC Davis Fruits and Nuts, and you click on the weather related models, then you're going to get um, some options to find your cumulative chilling hours. They'll go by county. There's a number of stations. And my closest station is Pomona. Um, and then there's also in Riverside County, you can see some that might be close to you depending on where you are. So right now um, in, for example, Pomona, which is sort of the West End of San Bernardino County, then uh, last month we had um, 263 chill hours and we are up to 380 chill hours for our fruit trees. So we're doing good on that, but 380, you'll see in just a moment, um, if it really warms up, like what did they say? What animal wasn't the groundhog? Oh, it was a turtle that the, the underground tortoises, tortoises were starting to emerge in California, Southern California, signaling the signs of spring and the warming. So if, if 380 chill hours is all we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna have a problem. Uh, Joshua tree went from 500 or 400 chill hours to 800 and 627 chill hours. So if you guys have questions about the two different numbers, I'm happy to share that. I don't know how familiar you are with chill hours, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But if you remember here, Pomona is at 380 chill hours today. And you can pull up maps like this, which give you all kind of information. I love this website. Um, the chill hours, if you're not familiar, are the number of hours below 45 degrees and above 32 required for fruit, um, a fruit species between November 1st and February 15th. So in five days, then um, some people stop counting. I noticed that the UC Davis Fruits and Nuts website counts till the end of February. And the only reason there is a limit limit on when the chill hours start accumulating is, is that the chill hours help, um, lack of chill hours causes the death of buds, extended blooms, poor fruit set, and extended bloom times increases the pathogens that may enter the flower and damage the fruit or keep it from producing. So the chill hours are really important. But if the chill hours come too late in the year, like I remember several years ago, we had snow up in Big Bear on uh, Memorial Day. Um, those chill hours are damaging to the fruit and not productive towards helping. But I did notice that the fruits and nuts runs till February 28th or 9th. Um, but it's approximately between November 1st and February 15th when we need to get those chill hours. And if you're growing fruit trees in the Inland Empire, then and even up in the high desert, although it's less of a concern up there, um, but it's usually planting the wrong variety of trees that um, need more chill hours that causes problem with fruit set, or it could be not having adequate pollination, which is a different story. But if you remember that in Pomona, we've had 380 chill hours, um, you can see that like apples, even a low chill hour apple 
might struggle. There's some low chill hour apricots, which would be okay. Most of the cherries are probably not gonna set. Your figs, you've got plenty of chill hours for figs. Peaches and pears are really gonna struggle this year. Um, there are some Asian pears, which take less chill hours. Some nuts like the pecans and almonds. You can see the persimmon has gotten plenty of chill hours. Um, but these others like the plum, it's probably not going to be a great fruit year. We'll have to see. Maybe we'll get some more cold weather and the pomegranate will be fine. So I'll drop this link in the chat as well at the end of the presentation. And this will also be available. All of these links will be available on a resource sheet that we'll share with you. So if you don't want to pull them out of the chat, we'll be posting all these resources on one PDF that you can access. Okay. But this is that fruits and nuts website that I talked about where you can get the weather related models. So what to plant in February? There's all kinds of stuff to plant in February. Um, we've got our ornamentals, our veggies and herbs, our fruit trees and our natives. Um, but normally the spring and the fall are great times to plant a lot of your trees and bushes and flowers and natives because of the rain that we're getting. And I'll just keep repeating it throughout the presentation that we so far have not gotten the rain. If you planted natives, well, we'll cover that in just a little bit, but they're probably gonna need some extra support if we don't get the rain that we normally get. So different trees, you know, you can do your bare root shrubs, your vines, your trees and perennials. I've seen lots of berries in the market right now. They're going fast, but there are bare root fruit trees in the market, grapes as well. Um, you could plant your living Christmas tree and uh, the dormant shrubs that are currently in bloom, like the camellias and azaleas, also could be planted. Now, normally you would say don't plant your tropical plants like citrus or avocados until March. And this is always, I feel like as a gardener, like, I mean, in Southern California, it's all, you know, we have our seasons, but this time of year and like October, it's like, will it, won't it? Right now, like, will we get another hard freeze? It's possible. Usually the coldest time of the year for us is toward the end of, end of February. February is also usually the wettest month, I think, January and February. And that's not happening. So if you do decide that you really want to plant tropical plants or any frost sensitive plants, be on the lookout because it's not too late for us to have a, a, a heavy frost event, especially with the sort of crazy weather that we've been having. So if you're not wanting to worry about frost protection, you might want to hold off on those until March. There's a couple ornamental trees. Well, there's many ornamental trees, including the acacia, dogwood, forsythia, lilac, flowering quince, and again, your living Christmas tree that you can plant. Um, lots of ornamental seeds, uh, flower seeds that you can sow. I won't read off the list, um, but lots of ornamental flower seeds that you can sow. I noticed though, like the pansies that I had planted, they are they just went down in the heat and the impatience as well. So um, the alyssum is going strong and can handle that heat and my dianthus is doing pretty well. The petunias are often a warm season plant. So planting now means as seeds means they'll come up and be um, growing when it warms up a little bit. Your California poppies do best when seeded in the fall followed by a good rain. I actually am um, starting to see around my neighborhood, there's a couple of patches of poppies which are blooming and it seems awfully early. Um, you could try to seed poppies now, but especially with how dry it is, unless you're getting some, giving it supplemental water, um, they're, they're probably gonna struggle a little bit. Your roses, um, January is probably the best time to plant roses. And if you haven't planted them by now, it's not too late. Um, I haven't, I uh, haven't seen any bare root. Uh, I can't say. There may still be some bare root roses in the nursery. They were probably there mostly in December and January, especially. Um, but if you haven't planted your roses, you still could. Um, for uh, These are a couple options. Again, I'm not going to read the list, but for some good cutting roses, and I'll, I'll put a PDF of this if you guys want to review this later. Um, also, this lists some fragrant roses. My Mr. Lincoln right now is in full bloom and um, it's looking pretty fabulous and smells pretty good. And uh, your bulbs, you can continue planting bulbs. I noticed that um, the daffodils and planting are 
should have planted them last month. If you haven't planted them now, it's probably not too late, but your time is ticking and I would get them planted as soon as possible. Um, yeah, and some people see, uh, somebody commented their lupin is starting to bloom. Everything is off. And so I say it's still time to plant cool season veggies. The Brussels sprouts and celery prefer to be planted in the warm fall soil. The soil is probably warm enough now for the Brussels sprouts and celery, but they take a long time to mature. And I think it's gonna get too hot. I think the ship has sort of sailed for that. We're gonna look more at the cool season veggies in just a minute. It says protect frost sensitive veggies from the cold, but I think right now we're 50-50 where at least this last week, it's protecting them from the heat. And what's going to happen is, is that a lot of your cool season veggies, like the brassicas, your broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, they may go to flower. Your lettuce may go to flower very quickly just because it's so warm. So we'll talk about uh, when they go to flower in just a moment. Um, it's not all lost when they do, but they're, they're definitely going to need some heat protection uh, if you want to keep them going. And some of it you just can't help if it's just too warm. There's not a lot you can do about it. Your warm season veggies, you can start those soon. Um, a lot of people I know started their warm season veggies in mid-January. And I think for most of your warm season veggies, as long as you start them, the ideal time if you're starting them indoors is before the end of February. Um, and then in March, you can usually start planting them directly outside. So you can also be planting artichokes, rhubarb, asparagus, horseradish, uh, your kiwi fruits. For kiwi fruit, you need two, a male and a female. So make sure you get those. And uh, you can continue to plant, plant things like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, lettuces, and peas. The peas are probably, out of all those, going to do better with the heat coming on. Um, the other ones are probably going to go to um, seed. These are some other things you can do. Um, Again, the kale and the beets might go to, uh, to flower and to seed the lettuce as well, but carrots and onions, radishes and peas should be okay. And I wanna show you, well, I got a chart in just a moment. But so now is sort of wrapping up the time to consult your seed catalogs and plan your summer garden especially if you're gonna be ordering things. So you can start seeds indoors in late January or February, now is a good time to be starting them. Just because it's warm right now, doesn't mean it's gonna stay warm. We could still have some cold snaps. So don't get too, this is the time of year when I tend to get sort of, I tend to forget that my plants, like, you know, I haven't had to do a lot of extra watering. And so what I'm finding outside in my yard is, well, we'll talk about care in just a little bit and get distracted. But you can um, start your seeds indoors now. It's not too late to do that. And so there are tomatoes and your peppers and your herbs. And we have a presentation on that um, coming up. So look for that on our website. So here you can see like this is a vegetable planting guide for California and Arizona. And you'll see on the right hand side, you have C and W. And um, here again, and if you're not familiar with that, that's cool and warm season veggies. Your cool season veggies are the ones that can tolerate or enjoy the colder temperatures. It helps keep them from going to flower too quickly. And um, they also can tolerate the shorter days. The warm season veggies are often fruits um, and the cool season veggies that we eat are usually in immature flowers stems, um, root vegetables, things like that. Um, but the daytime, even though it's warm, um, we're still not getting a lot of sun. Uh, you know, we're only a month and a half or so after the shortest day of the year. So the sun is still making its way back up to the Northern hemisphere. And so um, if you have like, uh, I know people who are growing tomatoes right now, but they're going to do a lot better in four months um, being mature when they have those long days. So that's where we have the warm and cool season veggies. And so this is a list of the things that you can plant right now. And I already mentioned asparagus and beets. It's wrapping up the broccoli season. Broccoli takes a long time to mature, so um, or longer to mature than some things. So if you don't get it planted now, you're probably missing your window to plant it this year until the fall. Brussels sprouts and cabbage the same, unless the year really cools down and we have a cool spring, but it's not looking like it's gonna be like that. 
Carrots should be okay. Um, they might need a little bit of protection from the heat. You can also do maybe a last batch of cauliflower, but really pushing it. And, and maybe if you're up in a cooler area, like in the mountains or someplace where it's a little bit cooler, you can have more success with those brassicas. You can plant chives in most places in Southern California year round. You can be planting your collards, your endive, kale and kohlrabi, your leeks and lettuce. And this is by seed. So for all of these things, if you're buying transplants, like if you were to buy broccoli transplants, then you can kind of plant into March. But those plants are already like four to six weeks old. A few more things, mustard, onions, parsley, parsnips, peas, um, potatoes, radishes, rutabagas, and spinach. Your squash, you can get started. Uh, Swiss chard, turnip, zucchini, and you can also do a lot of planting of uh, strawberries. It's better to plant them in the fall, but if you didn't plant them in the fall, it's not too late to plant them now. So normally we would say like February is a little too early to plant your citrus or subtropicals, like I mentioned earlier, but it's awfully warm. So I don't know, probably, probably they'd be all right. I don't know. If we get a frost event, you need to, if you do plant citrus now and we get a frost event or avocados now, you need to be watching and protect them from the frost with either like frost cloth or you can even use like a light blanket. If you use any kind of plastic to protect your trees, you want to make sure the plastic isn't touching the trees because they can freeze right, right where they're making that contact point. If we do have um, some cold weather, then a lot of times, um, the farmers would like water their groves when a frost was expected because then the soil temperature stays right around 32. And then as the uh, frost, as, as the kind of ice in the ground melts, then it actually creates a little bit of heat. And you don't want your plants, if we have a frost, um, going into that dry. And especially if it's been so dry already. Um, if we have some kind of frost event, then any trees that are not properly watered or smaller plants will really suffer. So, and then the citrus and subtropical doesn't usually come in a bare root, and so you're not going to usually, you're not going to find those in the nursery since they don't go dormant. They'll be in a pot, and um, spring is the best time to plant those when we're sure the last danger of frost has passed. A publication I really like is the tried and true or something new. We'll have that um, link on our resource sheet so you can check that out and it has this great chart if you're into citrus um, you can see it's an entire page of successive ripening so it can show you which ones are ripe at what months of the year and so you could potentially have citrus in your yard almost year round um, for your fruit trees we talked about earlier about chill hours you can see in the inland empire if we don't get more chill hours then it's going to be a probably not a great year for stone fruit um, so you want to choose varieties in the Inland Empire that are low chill hour varieties. In the high desert and the mountains, you guys have a little bit more selection when it comes to chill hours. If you are looking for something that's going to do well in our warmer climate down here, then you want to, and if you're in a place where there's really hot summers, like especially toward, like in the high desert, for example, you want something that's an early ripening tree. We already talked about low chill hours so that they can do what they need to do. Um, and then you may need to find a pollinizer for your fruit tree. So you'll wanna investigate that. And then there's some trees like those multi grafted. A lot of people that don't have a lot of space will choose those cocktail trees that have more than one variety on it. And the main issue with those trees, they can be a lot of fun, but I sort of view them like a bonsai where they require a lot of attention and they're always competing with each other. So whether it's citrus or peaches and nectarines or whatever the cocktail tree that you get, all of those grafts, so you'll have like three or four different types of trees on one plant, they'll always be competing with each other and they'll need to be pruned well. So if you have questions about that, you can always reach out to our Master Gardener helpline. You may still find some bare root trees um, and some available still online. You wanna choose ones with healthy roots and you can also buy them in pots throughout the year, but right before they break dormancy is a great time to plant. This is a really cool um, poster or chart that you can get off of Dave Wilson's nursery. 
that's a website and it's an organization or a nursery wholesale nursery that works on um, one of the things they work on is creating low chill hour varieties they work with a lot of researchers to get low chill hour varieties and this is a really cool this is a, a chart on harvesting and shows all the different fruits and when you harvest them. So these are like the orange is all the different types of apricots. And so you can see harvesting for the apricots could run May all the way through September. So if you really like apricots, you could plant a couple varieties of apricots, or if you have a lot of pests, then maybe you wanna do an early harvest variety if you're working with a school then maybe an early or a late harvest variety for all of these things. This is a really cool chart and we'll put the link to that in our resource sheet. There's also a website called UCA and our home orchard, which has a lot of information as well. So, you know, normally this is like a great time to plant native plants and non frost sensitive plants. And it says like with the rains plants will usually establish on their own. Um, but I saw something the other day that was talking about you know, check in on your native plants. They really didn't get watered in this year. So if you planted anything from October all the way through now, it's not a bad time to plant, but they're not getting that supplemental water that they normally would get. So you're definitely gonna have to make sure you water them in to establish them. They don't necessarily like soggy soil, but they're not getting that supplemental rain, which is normally why our California natives like to be planted October to March or October to April. And so normally kind of the rule of thumb I tell people is if you planted through January or February, then that first summer, they're usually well enough established that they'll need a little bit of extra water, but not too much. And then if you plant like after February, then they really are gonna need some extra water during the summer or extra care, like they just don't establish that well. And with this year, with the dry weather, if you haven't been watering your plants in, just keep an eye on them this summer. Just because they are drought tolerant um, doesn't mean that without that watering in, um, they're not necessarily gonna be um, at their best for this summer. So just keep an eye on them. Okay, and um, frost sensitive plants usually can be planted now, I would say. Um, well, again, if we get a cold snap, they might need protection, but if you're concerned and they're really frost sensitive, then maybe March is a better time to be planting your native plants um, for frost sensitive varieties. We have some really great websites um, and I'll put those on the resource sheet as well. So you can check those out. Um, we've got, uh, I really like the Cal Flora and Select Tree and the Inland Valley Garden Planner sites. Those are really great. So I'll share those links. For pests, you wanna be on the lookout for leaf miners and citrus. We talked about that at the beginning. You want to be looking out for scales and aphids, slugs and snails. One advantage to the dry weather is I haven't seen a lot of slugs and snails, but if you do a good job watering, um, they may be out there. And um, so be on the lookout for those, but the gophers, the squirrels, and all of the rodents are going hard this year. So, and for most of those things, um, the best management for those is usually uh, mechanical barriers, you know, using gopher like hardware cloth at the um, hardware cloth uh, on the bottom of your um, raised beds or having, I know for my blueberries and my grapes, I have to uh, manage them so that they are not getting eaten before they have a chance to establish. Um, you can use dormant sprays, but I wanna caution you with dormant sprays that um, you know, if you imagine oil on your plants, um, it kind of acts as like a magnifier. So if you're using any kind of neem oil or any kind of insecticidal sprays um, in the heat, then you could be burning your plants. So uh, check out the, um, the weather report before you spray. And with the kind of heat we've had this last week, um, I would hold off on any kind of oil sprays. Um, or do it very early in the morning and try to do it when we have a predicted cool down because that oil is going to be on there um, for depending on conditions, you know, the oil could be sitting there for, you know, I don't know the exact times and it depends on the oil, but it could be up to at least a week. 
Um, but definitely on that first couple of days, you want to be doing any dormant oil sprays or any kind of neem oil sprays when it's not predicted to be hot. Okay. Um, and um, this is also referring to the use of dormant oil sprays and making sure that it's not too cold and all of that. I'll let you guys review this on the PDF if you're interested in that. Okay. Um, and any kind of, if you have any weed issues in your yard and you're going to spray any pre-emergent sprays, um, these weeds are coming up pretty fast from that rain we had in January. So you're kind of um, missing your window for those pre-emergent sprays. But anytime you spray for weeds, make sure you do a little bit of research, reach out to our helpline, and just make sure that you make choices, whether you're getting a pre-emergent for something that hasn't emerged or sprouted yet or a post-emergent for something you're already seeing. And I have a great website for that. Um, the things like the apricot trees with a fungus fungicide, um, you know, it's been so dry that at least in my area, that hasn't been an issue. So one advantage to the dry weather is a lot of the uh, molds and funguses that are weather related or moisture related are down a lot. So that's something good. Um, the ants, uh, we already talked about them keeping those harmful insects in your tree. And so you can either apply a mechanical barrier like a sticky material. Uh, hold, hold on just one second. Uh, give me just one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so you can use a mechanical barrier, like a tangle foot would be one option. Um, and also you wanna keep the canopy off of the ground of your trees, because then the only way that the ants can get into your trees um, is through the trunk. And that at least helps you identify them and manage them. I really like to use the pre-made um, ant bait stations. I find those to be really effective. And you wanna make sure you're not killing those ants, especially ants that are coming into your house. If you use any bait stations, you want them to take that bait back to the nest, so don't kill them. Um, and also for your roses and anything like that, you wanna prune them up off the ground. That's a good best practice. Um, oh, here, I'm muting myself and unmuting myself instead of changing the slide. There we go. So our UC Integrated Pest Management site is the place to go for us as master gardeners. And if you don't wanna go there, call us and we'll look things up for you. You can email us and send us pictures of your pests and diseases. This website helps you find least toxic methods and uh, talks about good best practices or cultural practices using pesticides as like a last option. Um, and then just be mindful especially in the spring, that even organic pesticides that are killing caterpillars or eggs, all of those caterpillars and eggs, not all the eggs, but all the caterpillars are future moths or butterflies and pollinators. So I saw one tip from a lady, um, oh, I'm totally blanking on her name, uh, but she wrote a book called Garden Nerd, uh, Christy, Christy Wilhelmini, um, that's not quite right, but she had recommended, she had a lot of problem with cabbage moth on her I think it was her broccoli or something. And, and she would cover them when they, when they were in the ground, she would cover them with a, a frost, a light frost cloth, kind of like a row cover. And that helped keep the pests out when the plants were young. And then when the plants were larger, like eight to 10 inches, I believe, maybe a little bit smaller than that, that's kind of big. But when the plants were a little bit larger, then she would maybe like seven, eight inches, something like that. Then she would lift the row cover off and um, then she would hand pick the pests and maybe relocate them. Like the tomato hornworm, one of our arch nemesis as garden gardeners, um, that, create, that, that turns into the sphinx moth. A lot of people see the bird poop caterpillar, um, which is the swallowtail butterfly larvae and think it's a pest. So just, just be mindful when you're eliminating your caterpillars in great masses, even like the, the fritillary and a lot of those, um, butterflies have a pretty pesty looking caterpillar. So um, just, just identify your pests before you treat them is always a good best practice. This is what the website looks like. We'll have this link on the resource sheet. And um, then uh, 
There's a home garden section and an agricultural pest section. You can look at them both, but both. But the home garden section is geared toward um, how we manage our pests um, at, you know, on a home gardening level. So just for care real quick, we've talked about a lot of these um, different things, but you can be mulching to keep the weeds down and the moisture in. If you're in a high fire danger area, you want to be mindful of mulching and you want to use a little bit heavier mulch in a high wind area so that your mulch doesn't all blow away. We're going to talk about fertilizer in just a minute, but um, usually you're going to be fertilizing your ornamental trees in the spring. A lot of them can go without fertilizer, so just fertilize as needed when you're seeing symptoms of nutrient deficiency. And if you're not sure, take a picture and send it to our Master Gardener helpline. You can fertilize your blooming flowers um, as desired. My grandma used to do them about once a month, and she had some pretty nice looking flowers. I don't fertilize quite as often and I don't have quite as much bloom. So um, it's kind of up to you. And then we're not gonna spend too much time on pruning. Um, just right now you wanna be cutting out your dead wood or your crossed branches. Um, with the wind we had, I suspect a lot of that pruning was done perhaps for you. Um, and usually the pruning is done a little bit earlier in the year, but I'm gonna leave these. If you guys have questions about pruning, um, I'll let you guys read these slides in the PDF, or you can always reach out to our Master Gardener helpline and we can walk you through pruning specific trees. Usually they say, um, get your rose pruning done before Valentine's Day with that hot spell that we've had. I noticed a lot of my roses are really leafing out. So I would say prune your roses if you really wanna shape them or um, kind of bring them back into shape. Um, but they have started leafing out, so they've kind of put their energy into that already a little bit. So probably with this year being so warm in the spring, then last month would have been a good time. But it's not too late. And with them, again, you can remove dead or diseased wood, cross branches. You want to open up the airflow. You can still divide your bulbs. It's not too late, but they are really rooting out. Um, so January is a little bit better and February, if you really, um, if, if you think they're really crowded and need to be thinned out, it's not too late. For your veggies, we already talked about planting your cool season veggies, or you could be beginning to plant your warm season veggies, protect them from frost or heat. On average, you want to fertilize your veggies every four to six weeks and uh, fertilize your strawberries in uh, February as they're starting to flower. So pretty much now you're going to be fertilizing, giving your strawberries a spring fertilizer. You want to protect your fruits and veg or veggies and herbs from pests. And then just keep an eye on watering. Um, right now, everything is just so dry. So I suspect your plants are needing water, but we always ask or encourage people to dig down into the soil and check before they water. For citrus, if you have a lot of fruit on your citrus tree, then it's not a bad idea to pick some or um, and thin them out because now with the wind and the dry weather and the heat, if you have a lot of fruit on your citrus or avocado, it could lead to limb breakage. And then you can cut out your suckers or dead and diseased wood. This is what that flush looks like. And you'll see that in the spring on your citrus. And that's what that Asian citrus psyllid is really going for. So if you're looking for the insect on your trees, look at the flush. That's where they like to lay their eggs. Um, these are the rootstock suckers, and they usually have long thorns. They can sometimes be like this. This would be like a water sprout, and these should be cut out any time of year because they take nutrients away from the tree that you're wanting to grow. Your stone fruit, um, even though they're dormant in the winter time, they are still needing a little bit of water. They're probably um, if they're in the ground and they're established, they're, they're probably okay with the rain. I don't know. They probably need a little bit of water and I would probably water them at least once a month. And then next month we'll talk about that spring watering that, um, schedule that you'll get on. Um, but for now they're probably, um, if they're in pots, you probably want to make sure that you, um, give them some water because their roots are still active. All right, and so right now they're probably somewhere between this breaking of dormancy and the swelling of buds. Although I have seen some trees flowering, which is crazy early. If we get a cold spell followed by a rain or a wind, uh, we're gonna lose those flowers. So we'll have to see. 
I'm not going to go into pruning too much. Um, it really should have been done last month for your fruit trees, except for cherries and apricots. Cherries and apricots you'll prune in August. They're prone to disease if it's too damp. I think this year it probably wouldn't have, would have been okay, but you never know. We might get another rain. So you're going to prune cherries and apricots in August and every all your other stone fruit. If it started to um, send out buds, then maybe you'll hold off. If you're trying to shape it, then go ahead and prune it. It's not too late. Um, and I'll let you guys read this if you want in the PDF, just some uh, pruning tips. Um, your natives, you know, a lot of them go summer dormant rather than winter dormant. So in January, my natives were just starting to leaf out because that's the first rain we really got. Um, and, uh, so they're just starting to kind of break that summer dormancy and they may need be needing water. So to keep an eye on your plants. My sages were getting really dry. So keep an eye on your plants. Um, and this is the time that they shine. My salvias, all these things are in bloom and they are looking, um, so fabulous, um, or they're getting there. So just enjoy them. Really quickly for other garden chores, um, for fertilizer, you've got your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Your nitrogen is what they call like the leaf maker. Your potassium is the flower inducer or fruit maker. And the phosphorus is the root maker. And so if you are planting strawberries now, not a bad idea to plant them with a phosphorus rich fertilizer that will help them with root development and help them get established for a good strawberry season ahead. Um, and the nitrogen is the first number, the phosphorus is the second number, and the potassium is the third number. And these nutrients are um, susceptible or sensitive to things like acidity. So your plants that are acid loving plants like your blueberries or your azaleas or rhododendrons, the reason they're acid loving is because if the pH of your soil is too high, then um, the iron is not available readily to these plants. So I think I put a slide in, no, I didn't, about acidifying your soil. I'll put links for acidifying your soil. If you're doing any blueberries this time of year, um, planting them, then it's good to know about acidifying your soil. And so as plants are breaking dormancy, then you can fertilize um, your citrus. You can fertilize it um, usually in February or March. It's a good time to fertilize your citrus. And if your roses are starting to leaf out, you could give them their first feeding of the year. One of the reasons that we um, don't fertilize too early is because we don't want them to leaf out before if there's like a frost coming. Um, and so usually that's why the recommendation is to wait till March, but it does seem like we're going to have a warm February. So if you do fertilize and it starts to send out that flush or that new growth, then you want to um, protect them from the frost if we get some cold weather. You can fertilize your Daphne, your asparagus, your cane berries, and your mature bloomers. And you always wanna make sure that you're not fertilizing dry plants. Um, if you didn't feed your azaleas, camellias, or rhododendrons, then um, they are kind of dormant right now, but you could give them a peat mulch, mulch and cotton seed meal. And your annual, annual flowers, you can fertilize um, fish emulsion, you just gotta be careful with fish emulsion because it causes the animals sometimes to dig in your yard. Wanna watch out for weeds, we'll share this link. This is also part of the integrated pest management page and um, they have great weed identification and weed management information. You can reach out to our helpline for this, but it's so important to know what weed you're dealing with because each one has like a different uh, strategy to deal with it, okay? And then we talked about mulch. You want to keep the mulch away from the base of your tree. So no to this here on the right. Keep it four to six inches away from the trunk of the tree. Keep it a couple inches deep. And um, native plants um, do not need or even like mulch. So we don't want that. Um, you can be applying compost this time of year. Compost um, is usually not something that native plants like or prefer. So you don't need to do that. But We'll have a composting workshop 
coming up and um, you can check our website. We have one coming up in March that's on the basics of composting and also one about the new composting uh, legislation that's in place. So um, you can uh, check those out on our website and learn all about composting there. Um, and for seed saving, most of your wildflowers, if they didn't drop off with the rain, they probably blew away with that wind. So um, there's probably not any wildflower seeds left, but if you're interested in learning about saving your cool season veggies or herb seeds, then check out our upcoming seed saving presentation. And um, we'll have a seed starting presentation also that we're putting on our website soon. So check that out. Watch for temperatures under 32 degrees. I don't know if that's gonna happen. Watch for heat. So right now we need to be ready to protect from frost. We need to be ready to protect from heat. You can use basically like the same light cloth to protect from both frost and heat. But if you have questions, reach out to our helpline. And it's not too late to plant your cover crops if you were gonna use any cover crops. But normally they get watered in by the rain and uh, that is so far not happening. So anybody who's planting cover crops, those plants are probably gonna need some supplemental water. So just keep that in mind. Lawn care, um, if you have lawns, you're going to need to give them extra water. So keep an eye on that. Um, and you're not getting any help from mother nature right now on that. And um, we did have some soggy soil and that can lead to compacted soil if we get more rain. So when we do get rain, you wanna avoid sort of um, walking on your lawn if you can, um, but I don't think that's gonna be an issue. So that's it for me. Um, it is 7.03. I apologize for keeping you guys a few minutes over. Um, check out our website for more classes. We have our upcoming seed saving for veggies and herbs class. We have an upcoming class on SB 1383, that compost um, redirecting um, compost recycling um, legislation that went through. So that's going to be a great presentation. We have a composting basics coming up, and then we have a few more um, presentations. So check those out on our website this weekend. We have an Ask a Master Gardener time on Sunday that's online. So you can ask questions live to us then, or you can also come to Highland Library on Saturday from 11 to one if you're in the area, but we'll be online on Sunday and that can be found on our website and we'll be there just to answer questions. You can show us photos of your yard and we can see if we can help you out, okay? And you can always reach out to our Master Gardener helpline by phone or by email and we're here to answer your questions. So this presentation has a lot of links. So I'm gonna put these in a resource sheet rather than dropping them in the chat. Um, I really thank you guys for joining us today.